Hi, welcome to the next of our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. Today we're going to be talking about Gauss's Law and a vector calculus principle called divergence. If you happen to be in my class, um, the things we're going to cover in this video are out of our textbook, sections 3-5 and also sections 4-4. Okay, so we've learned about three things so far. We've learned that electricity, this thing we're trying to understand, um, basically is represented by a material property called charge, that charge creates electric field, and we can also represent this vector field as a flux. It maps essentially a vector or a direction and magnitude to every point in space. And we also know that we can represent um, electricity in terms of the potential energy field created that, that essentially is the energy in other charge fields um, in the, the, the energy field created by one charge. That's not a very good way to say it. Let's put it a different way. That a charge creates a potential energy field, and if another charge comes into it, that potential energy field that we call the voltage says how much potential energy the charge has. Um, and we've learned also that there are some relationships between these charges. We know we can go from charge to the electric field through this integral, and there are a lot of different integrals, and I've written the most complicated one here, which is a triple integral, because we're thinking about a charge distribution over a volume, and we're integrating over the volume. It's simpler if you're doing surface charges, line charges, and it's essentially basically Coulomb's law if you have point charges. Uh, we also know that it's often simpler to calculate the potential field, because rather than having a cube term in the denominator over here, we can do this triple integral and calculate the, the potential, and it's just an easier integral to do. We also know there's an integral relationship uh, to convert from the field um, over to the voltage. The, we do the line integral um, of the field on any path, and that'll basically determine what the potential is, and we can do it between two points. If we want to know the overall potential, we can do it from infinity. And we also know that if you do any closed line integral around a loop, you're going to get zero, and that just expresses conservation of energy. We can also go from potential, which is a scalar field, back to the electric field, which is a vector field, by taking the gradient of the field right here. And we think, gee, with all these relationships between charge field and flux vector fields and the voltage or potential scalar field, shouldn't we have some relationships back the other way? And in fact, that's what today's lecture is going to be about. That's we're going to, what we're going to talk about, moving from field back to charge distributions. So here we have the um, uh, a point charge, and we have our, our vector field uh, given by the arrows, and I've also drawn some, some scalar potential lines here with our charge Q being here in the middle, and we know that the, the vector field is essentially given by Coulomb's law, which is right there. Um, <clears throat> if we take a look at any tiny little uh, two-dimensional box of space, we notice something. We notice if we, we look closely, there are about as many flux arrows or electric field lines going in as there are going out. And this is true um, for practically any point in space. Uh, we have arrows going in and we have arrows going out. We have arrows going in. We have arrows going out. But if I were to put this box around the charge Q in the center, then I've got a situation where the arrows are all going out and we have no arrows going in in this case. And so there's a general principle that this represents. And that is that the flux through a surface is somehow related to the charge inside the surface. The number of arrows going through a surface, and remember we have a technical definition for flux we talked about in an earlier video, but the flux through a surface is related to the charge inside a surface. But, but unfortunately we've got to work in three dimensions most generally, so instead of little boxes we've got to use little cubes. And so if I want to express this mathematically, uh, this is the formula I'm going to use right here, that if I take the integral over a closed surface, so if I summed up um, all, so all six sides of this cube, um, that, that the, the flux through all of the surfaces is going to be equal to the charge enclosed, or another way that I do that, it's if I instead of a, of having a point charge, if I have a volume charge distribution, is the closed surface integral of the flux through a surface is equal to the overall charge inside the surface where I've summed over a volume, and and, and this lets us into the next of the relationships. <laughs> 
So here's our electrostatics triangle when we go ahead and represent this. Um, we can see that we've got another relation shown right here. Um, but this is, this is kind of intuitively unsatisfying because we've got an integral relationship going from charge to field, and we've also got an integral relation going from field back to charge. Wouldn't it be nice to do a simpler derivative operation? And in fact, there is one. And if we dig into this thing that says the flux through any closed surface, which is this integral right here, is equal to the total charge inside that closed surface, summing up the, the volume charge density over the volume, we can derive a derivative expression. So let's take some arbitrary vector field in three-dimensional space right here, and we can represent the electric flux in this three-dimensional vector field. And, and notice I've really only drawn it in two dimensions because I can't do three dimensions very well on this computer, but we're pretending it's in three dimensions. Um, the overall flux vector field is given by the um, x component of the flux in the x direction, the y component of the flux in the y direction, and the z component of the flux in the z direction. Um, and so let's zoom in right here on, a, on one section of what this vector field looks like. And what you're going to find is if you take a little tiny cube, and, and, and a, a really super tiny cube like we'd use in calculus of, of volume close to zero, that it's going to be oriented inside the vector field like this. So, so if we look at this a little bit more closely, how can we draw this cube? Um, let's put one corner of the cube here at some arbitrary position x, y, and z. And then we know that, that the other corner of the cube is going to be a little farther in x. So let's call it x plus delta x, um, y plus delta y, and z plus delta z. So this corner of the cube is essentially um, given by a little bit more in z direction. This one is the same thing, but a little bit more in the x direction. You get the idea. We've basically just blocked out some cube in three dimensions. And our overall flux vector, d, which is the long vector here, essentially we can represent as, as three different vector components. No matter which direction d points at, we've got our x component of d. Over here, we've got our y component of d. And up here, we've got our z component of d. And then let's remind ourselves what we're trying to do is we're trying to calculate the flux through the surface, or the flux through all six sides of the cube. And remember, our flux, the way we define it, is the total amount of vector field d that's going through some surface of area delta A, and we've got a normal to the direction here. And so the overall flux is essentially going to depend on whether the flux rays hit um, perpendicular to the surface or parallel to the normal to the surface in. And we just represent that by the dot product. But we're going to set this up so we essentially don't need to deal with the dot product, that all our flux vectors are essentially perpendicular, so we count them all. OK, well, this ends up being a pretty straightforward problem when we set it up this way. And, and with most problems, they're not that hard to solve. It's the setting up of the problem that's the real pain in the butt. Um, so if we think about our, our generic vector d and our little tiny cube uh, with some volume delta v here, um, we know that we can represent the flux as having three components, as I said previously. And so essentially, let's only consider the x component of this flux vector. So we're only going to consider this part of the whole equation at first. OK, so here's our little cube. We know we've got um, basically the volume is, is delta z, delta y, delta x, all multiplied by each other. Those are simply the lengths of each side. And we're only considering the flux going in the x direction, d sub x. So all we really need to consider is those two sides of the cube, because those arrows going in the x direction are not going to pass at all through the tops of the cubes or the other sides of the cubes. The, because those sides are parallel to the arrows, the overall flux is 0. That's what that dot product means. And so if we want to go ahead and write the flux going through this cube, we, we basically define that fluxes going into things are negative, and fluxes going out of things are positive. Uh, you could define it the other way around, but this is simply the way it's done. Fluxes going into things are negative, fluxes going out of things are positive. And so the overall flux is just going to be the negative flux coming in this side, and then the positive flux going out at this new x position, which is just x plus delta x. OK, whenever you see an expression like this that has an x plus delta x component in it, it should trigger in you an old calculus trick. And that calculus trick is essentially 
um, to do something called a Taylor's expansion on it. And, and you've probably heard of this before. It's something you probably covered like me at the very end of your calculus class and had no idea how it was really useful, but, but now is the time it comes in useful. So if we actually do a Taylor's expansion of this, um, this stays the same, but this term expands to be this right here. And if you remember anything about your Taylor expansions, there's a bunch of higher order terms with like delta x squared and delta x cubed and delta x to the fourth that I'm leaving off because we've made the assumption that delta x is really, really small. These aren't big cubes. These are little tiny cubes. And the size is so small that delta x is small. Delta x squared is minuscule. And delta x to the third or the fourth power is so small we can ignore it. So we're ignoring the delta x squared and everything above it. And that's a common and trick we use in physics and mathematics all the time to do a Taylor series and, and, and ignore a bunch of the terms. Well, once we do this Taylor series trick, then it becomes easy. When we just sum uh, the negative flux going in and the positive flux going out, we see that term and that term cancel out completely. So the overall change in the uh, flux dx across the cube is just given by this term right here. And so if that's the change in D, the overall flux is just that term multiplied by the area of the side, and we know the area of those gray sides is this delta Y delta Z, and we found the total change in flux from only the X component of the vector. So the next trick is to do the same trick for the Y component and the Z component. Well, well, that's pretty straightforward. All we do now is we just consider the y component of the vector. Uh, we look at the two opposite sides. We think of the, the components of, of our overall uh, vector d that are flowing in the y direction. And if you go through it, you come out with exactly the same expression. And in fact, you can do exactly the same thing for the z component of the overall vector d and find that you get this expression right here. So if I've just repeated the exact same things. I just basically said, what's the difference? Use the Taylor series expansion, then multiply it by the area of each side. Now, when I do this, um, and I add all the parts up, all the x component up, the y component up, and the z component up to get the overall change in flux from the cube, I come up with an expression that looks like this. Um, here's the uh, basically volume of the cube, delta V, the x side times the y side times the z side, and, and essentially all I have left are these derivative terms of the x component, the y component, and the z component. And if you remember our del operator here, which is just the x derivative plus the y derivative plus, plus the z derivative, you notice that this expression essentially can be written as the del operator dot product with our vector d multiplied by the volume element delta v. And so delta v is just this thing right here. Del dot d is just this bigger thing over here. Well, this is how you write it all out, but those mathematicians, because their hands get tired writing big, long expressions like this in, in vector calculus, really only write it this way. You notice when we write it this way that the overall flux through the sides of the cube, as we said, is equal to the charge inside the cube, which is just the charge density, uh, charge per cubic meter, multiplied by the volume of it in cubic meters. And when we do this, we notice these volume elements cancel off to both sides. And we get something called the divergence theorem. Um, or if we're talking with charge, we call it Gauss's law right here. That, that the del operator um, dotted with the flux vector d is equal to the ch volume charge density. And this essentially lets us say, if we have a vector field d, and we take del dot d, um, the divergence, this is called. So let's write divergence next to this here. If we write the divergence, we get the, the volume charge density. Okay, so this is derivation-like, but, but what does it really mean? It turns out that if you have a little cube, and this cube is embedded in some kind of, of, of volume charge density, if you have flux rays that are coming out of the sides of the cube, um, this happens to be what we call a source of flux rays. And it means there's some kind of charge, positive Q, inside that little volume element. If, on the other hand, um, you have a little volume where flux rays are going into, and there are more flux rays going in than are coming out, this is called a sink. It's something like a negative charge that sucks up the flux rays. And so essentially, del dot d will tell you whether any point in space is a source, in other words, flux rays 
emanate from that place, so you have positive charge, or a sink where flux rays are ending and you have a negative charge. If you have a, v a value of del dot z equals zero, it simply means flux rays are going through this cube. They're not starting within the volume and they're not ending within the volume. So the divergence theorem will tell you where flux rays start from, sources, where they end at sinks, and if the value is zero, it means you don't have any charge there whatsoever because this term goes to zero. So we're almost done here. We can now represent our electrostatics triangle in a much happier way where we have integrals going from charge to vector fields and from charge to scalar fields and from vector fields to scalar fields on the outside. We also can go through differential operations, derivative type operations from voltage to vector fields, from scalar fields to vector fields, and now with this new one we've defined from vector fields back to charge distributions. Um, we only have one more thing to talk about to fill out this triangle, and we'll do that in the next lecture. But what I want to do now is go through an exercise where we'll start with charge. We'll basically use that charge to calculate the voltage. We'll go from the voltage and calculate the field, and then we'll see if we go from the field and use our new divergence operator here, if in fact we get back to our original charge distribution. So let's take a tour all the way through this triangle. Now this would be a real pain in the butt to do if I had to do it um, using calculus, sort of analytical mathematics. I'd have to choose my problems really carefully and keep track of a lot of stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of this and go to another video that you'll see in a minute, and I'm essentially going to do this example in MATLAB. And essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate a potential from 10 different charges. Then I'm going to plot it as a scalar field, um, go from the scalar field and do the gradient to get the electric field, and then from that calculate the divergence, and we'll see if the charges I calculate with the divergence actually line up with the original 10 charges. So essentially what I've done is I've created a MATLAB script you just saw to put 10 point charges at random positions in space. And when I run the MATLAB script, this is what I get. And what we're plotting is the scalar field of the potential from those 10 point charges. You don't see 10 point charges here. You essentially only see um, eight dots because it looks like we've got two point charges so close to one another they overlap here, and two point charges so close to one another they overlap right there. Now, if I write a MATLAB script, which I've done, to take the gradient of this field, uh, that'll turn it into a vector field, which is proportional, at least the negative of the gradient, to the electric field. And this is what we get when we overlay that. Here you see the arrows going out for the electric field from the charges, and um, that's overlaid on top of the scalar field of the potential. So what happens if I take the divergence of this vector field and I complete the triangle, I go back to my original charge distribution. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the gradient of the vector field. I should get back to something that looks kind of like the original distribution of my charges. And in fact, that's what I do. I can see in this case, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 discrete charges. What happens if we run this a second time just so we can see it? Here we've got 10 charges randomly spaced. This is the potential. Um, this is what happens when we look at the vector field, uh, the electric field we get by taking the gradient of that, and when I take the uh, divergence of the gradient field, voila, I get my 10-point charges back.